The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. This is Nick Brisboy with Biamp Systems, and today we're going to take a look at the TCM1 beam tracking microphone. Uh, we're going to go over some of the uh, tips for putting in it into a file, some of the basics of getting it laid out, and take a look at a few of the options that are available with the microphone. I'd like to give a little plug for some upcoming monthly webinars that we're starting here in North America. Um, we will be putting these on on a regular basis. Uh, you can go to our webpage at support.biamp.com. We've got a new icon for webinars. You can click through to that to see what else is coming up and to register for those. Uh, they're presented also internationally, so uh, we have them at many hours through the day and night. All right, in today's webinar, we're going to have a overview of the new technologies in the beam tracking ceiling mics. Uh, we're going to look at best practices and in installation to get the best performance out of these mics. These offer us a cost-effective solution, providing exceptional audio uh, that's seamlessly integrated into the DSP platform and familiar uh, workflow that you have with Tessera. Um, if you've been using it already, it's really nice because it just drops right in and things just fall in place. If you're interested in specking out the TCM mics for new projects, if you're putting a new DSP file together with the TCM mics, or you're commissioning mics that are in a room already, uh, we should have something for everybody today. Uh, for small rooms, these mics offer a one-wire solution. We'll take a look at that. Just a single category cable with inline PoE. It's all you need from a AVB card and up to three TCM pendants, and also two zones of amplification when you have the TCM 1A. Um, Commissioning is straightforward. The beam tracking algorithm will follow the users in a 360 degree circle around the pendants. And so we're not reliant on preset locations for users to stand or sit. Uh, they can move around the rim freely and the mic follows them. Uh, we offer a simple calculator. Uh, you put in some room specifications and it'll give recommendations on where to place the microphone. Uh, so it really takes the guesswork out of putting these in. All right, today we're going to take a look at the TCM family of hardware. We'll look at the behavior of the mic and the beam tracking algorithms, uh, the Tessera software components when you lay out your file. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the acoustics of a room and why placement still matters with these microphones. We will take a look at the coverage calculator for the TCM mics, and we'll look at the custom blocks that are associated with the TCM1. Those are strongly recommended any time that you are using those mics. We'll look at how to set up rooms with multiple mics, including divisible spaces, uh, how to integrate the uh, room combiner blocks with them. We will talk about how to put together a simple Q-Bus system so you can listen to your mics while you're commissioning them. And we'll talk a bit about the TCM1A uh, amplifier package as well. All right, the TCM family of hardware. Uh, we have three options within the TCM family right now. The TCM1, which is a mic pendant, it's the base station, that's your first block, um, or the TCM1A, which is the uh, pendant. It also has two channels of integrated amplifier um, all over one PoE uh, cable. Then we have the PoE or the TCM1EX, and these are expansion boxes. These can be daisy chained uh, along with either the one or the 1A. And these allow you to expand into the room. And we're just doing a point-to-point uh, -point connection between them with a CAT5 cable. And this allows you to continue your simple wiring plan. Uh, we're not having to run extra cables from the switch up to these devices. And we're not hogging any more PoE ports uh, in using them. The nice thing about this is the uh, single point of connection with AVB from the TCM1 or 1A, and then the others are daisy chained into the 1 or 1A. Uh, so we're not uh, using a lot of bandwidth. So this is the basic configuration with the TCM1 with a couple of expanders. The next option would be to throw in uh, a TCM1A, uh, the amplifier, with some expanders. And the 1A will drive either 4 ohm or 8 ohm loads. So depending on what your speaker load is, uh, you can do two to four speakers off of that. So this is a very simple system. You would just have a control interface then from your Forte out to the PC and whatever control system you chose. When we look in device maintenance to try and find the devices, uh, we find some new options. 
uh, we have a locate feature, which will pulse the LED icons on, or the LEDs on the uh, microphones. So if we've got a large installation with uh, two or more microphones, it's simple to find out which one is which just by opening up your locate menu and clicking on the locate option, and then it will start sequentially flashing the devices. This can make life very straightforward. Uh, also with the 1A, it will announce the uh, speaker locations uh, audibly. So it will say, this is channel one, this is channel two, and we'll play that out for you. So you can find out exactly where your locations are. When we look in the device maintenance, there's something unique about these devices. They don't use IP addresses as everything else does. So we see the not available under the IP address header. Uh, these are all uh, discovered using MAC address. So uh, we don't have to worry about giving them IP addresses. Uh, additionally, when we have the expanders connected onto a host device, the 1A or the 1, then they're going to appear as a subset of the 1A or the 1. So when you click on the device and then click on the TCM1 or 1A properties, it will show you a pop-up menu that will show the associated EXs. So if we've got one or two EXs, they'll show up here. It'll give the serial number. It'll give the uh, information on the box. Uh, it, they don't appear individually within device maintenance, and this can be confusing the first time you use them. Now we'll get into the behavior of the microphones. So what the TCM brings to the table, the, the very important thing that we bring to the table with this is the new beam tracking behavior. We get three independent zones within the, uh, with each pendant, and we have steerable lobes that are tracking users in the horizontal and vertical axis. Take a quick um, look in just a moment at the polar patterns, but essentially we have a cardioid pattern which is tracking users uh, in 320 degree segments around the room. Within the beam tracking behavior, we have a few new technologies. We've got voice activity tracking. So this is continuously watching all the audio captured by the mic. We're aggressively filtering with noise reduction to remove background noise. And this is uh, being done just to monitor users. This is not the audio stream going out to the far end. So this is how we identify where people are in the room. And then we have another audio stream that goes out to the far end. So we're using a, a very aggressive noise reduction to get rid of background noise, and we're filtering to determine what is human speech and what's not. We've got some algorithms running, which are uh, allowing it to pinpoint users as opposed to doors slamming, uh, cars driving by, things like that. Once we've uh, identified the audio from a person, then we've got beam waiting, which allows the zones to track to a talker's location as they were determined by the voice activity detection or voice activity, voice activity tracking. Um, and it allows us to look at the whole microphone, the three uh, lobes working in conjunction and compare and contrast what they're hearing. So if somebody approaches the overlap between two zones, we can listen to those two signals and determine that they're the same talker. Now we just wanna know which one is the louder one, uh, giving us priority for the louder one and we'll, uh, mute the one that's not uh, the primary lobe. So we don't get phasing issues with sort of double coverage between people. We'll select the strongest voice in each uh, location and we can track multiple voices simultaneously. So we're not limited to one talker per microphone. We can have people, uh, multiple talkers around the microphone and we'll have multiple lobes active and tracking to them. So we're determining the strongest signal for each voice uh, when we're comparing those voice signals. And finally, when we've got multiple pendants in use, we've got to determine uh, if I've got two pendants and I've got a talker who's situated fairly close to the middle of those two pendants, uh, we need to determine which pendant should be picking them up because we don't want to have the same signal coming from two pendants at the same time. So we use an intelligent mixing algorithm to determine which source is the best among duplicates and it will choose that one. So again, we're looking at each unique voice and comparing the signal from that voice across multiple pendants, it's not affecting multiple voices being picked up in both pendants. And then finally, we have beam tracking algorithms and AEC algorithms uh, sharing data uh, under the hood to work together. And this is the patented component of the TCML1 beam tracking behavior. Um, it allows one zone or one channel of AEC to be utilized for three coverage zones in a pendant. 
So each pendant uses only, although it's got three zones, it only uses one AEC channel. So we can be very efficient with AEC. Uh, we can use the Forte VT4s uh, with uh, just four channels of AEC to do three pendants plus a uh, podium mic or a lavalier mic as our fourth input. And that AEC interaction allows us to track what the ceiling speakers are putting out versus what the talkers in the room are doing. And we can ignore the ceiling speakers because we know about what they're gonna be playing because it's being sent to the reference and we'll track to the actual human talkers in the room and not follow up to the, to the far end voice. All right, the beam tracking algorithm. Um, we've got the three pendant lobes that I mentioned. Uh, this is the polar plot looking at them. They're not fixed. These are tracking. We can see the uh, behavior here. We've got a kind of a range that it can follow in zone number one of 120 degrees. And what the beam tracker will do is keep the zero, the uh, on axis edge of that particular cardioid lobe pointing towards the active talker. So we can see that in the software. Uh, and we'll see that in just a moment. Uh, let's see if we can pull up the video of this one. Grab that video in just a moment here. Um, and we can see the lobes actively tracking to talkers as they move through the space. Um, each zone or each lobe will track within 120, 120 degree uh, coverage zone, and then the next lobe will take over. And we can watch that into Sierra software uh, and see the people moving throughout the room and allow the users to define the space. As they move, they can uh, be covered by the microphone and we have real-time coverage. So here's a still shot of what those mic trackers look like. And we've got three quadrants. They're indicated by three different colors. We've got a green, a red, and a blue zone. And they sort of are doing a heat intensity as people talk, those will illuminate as their voice dies away, uh, those will go dark. So we can see where people are, are uh, participating in the room. The next thing we'll look at here is the coverage calculator. And then we'll jump into some software in just a couple of minutes to see this behaving live. Here we've got a screenshot of our coverage calculator. This is available at support.biamp.com and you can go to the calculators page and you'll see that we've got an option for the TCM1 calculator. It allows you to define your coverage area um, in terms of your mic height. So we can set the mic height above the floor. That's your installed height. We can have the talker's height above the floor. You can customize that or choose a standing or sitting height uh, by default. And then you can choose your room acoustics. Uh, from poor to fair to good to great and perfect. And really what we're interested there uh, in there is what is the background noise level of the room? Um, what is the ambient space? Um, is it a, a great sounding room? If it's a recording studio, uh, we might be able to look at that as a perfect scenario. Um, we've got incredible noise isolation. We don't have mechanical noises. Um, all the way back to a poor room where we've got a lot of bleed over. Uh, from uh, rooms adjoining, we've got air handler noises, things like that, things that will raise the background noise floor of the room and will constrain what we can actually do in terms of uh, putting somebody far away from a microphone. So in the good mode, our average mic to talker max distance, we would say is 10 feet. So this is kind of what we would recommend for it. Now let's take a look here. We're gonna jump over to a live view of the calculator. easier to show than tell. Okay, so we can say that we're gonna put a microphone at eight feet above the floor and it will illustrate that in our, our drawing. You see here we have a cone of coverage and this is not a hard constraint on the microphone. This is showing the best coverage area for uh, this application as you're defining it here. So if I say, okay, the users are gonna be standing, it'll say their voice is uh, gonna be present at about the six foot height. And if you say, well, you know, they're a little bit uh, shorter or taller, we can modify that and 
adjust and constrain for whatever the local application is. It'll show the effective coverage area. This is a 360 degree circle um, shown as a, almost 20 feet wide. So we've got 10 feet along the hypotenuse here. If we look in the coverage mic, we can see 10 feet is shown. That's our effective distance from the mic before we say that you're uh, not going to get good results anymore for your talker. So if we say the room acoustics are poor, you're going to have to come in closer to the mic to be heard well. If we have a room that's perfect, you can step further away from the mic. So you might be able to get uh, up to 16 and a half feet away from the mic. Here we've got some sample room recordings. Uh, these are made with TCM mics. And so you can choose from the drop down what are the room conditions that we recorded under, the distance that we made the recording, um, if you'd like to do unfiltered audio or put a uh, basically a phone uh, a VoIP uh, constraint on it uh, to mimic phone sound. And you can listen to different samples of microphones from the TCM mics. So it predicts the, well, let's go back to the good coverage area of about 19 feet uh, side to side. Now we can come in and look at our room and we can say, okay, I've got a good room that we're doing. We'll say it's 46 by 28. And we can plot the microphone coverage based on the square footage of the room. We have a coverage map that shows the center points of the microphones and we show an overlap area between each mic. If we'd like to choose less coverage overlap, we can choose it. And you'll see that we get some red zones that are showing that we're not going to have adequate coverage there. Um, and we can customize. We can say, I'd like to come somewhere in between those. I'd like to do 25% instead of 8% or 50%. And so we can fine tune this based on the room. We try to average this out uh, for the usable area in the room. Uh, but keep in mind that you can tailor this. You can say, you know, the room in reality is 60 feet long and 35 feet wide. I can sort of massage the numbers to show the effective area that I need people to participate in. We can change the coverage from distance map to coverage circles, uh, depending how you like to look at this. And again, we can go to the sample recordings to get an idea of what we should expect for users in this area. Once you've got settings that you like, you can come up here and hit generate link. And this will give you a link that you can copy and paste, and it will auto-populate this calculator with the results that you've used uh, today. All right. Um, that brings us to the room environment. Uh, had a little slide in the beginning there that said placement still matters. It's not, it's not magic. Uh, what it comes down to is as people move farther away from a microphone, we're going to have uh, their voice getting quieter and quieter. Uh, perfect application would be losing 6 dB per doubling of distance as they get further away from a microphone. So a talker who is at 70 dB, about a foot away from their face, uh, they're down to 64 dB at two feet away, 58 dB at four feet away, and in this application, about uh, 56 dB at five feet away. So we've got a microphone that's at distance, and we cannot uh, can't really do any better than that unless they start shouting. Their voice is going to be about 56 dB at that mic location. If we have a room that's very noisy, if we've got a 50 dB noise floor in that room uh, at the microphone, then we've only got 6 dB of uh, gain between that background noise floor and the spoken word. So we're never going to be able to get rid of that background noise floor and have an acceptable outcome. So we want to look for at least a minimum of 12 dB between that background noise floor level and the talker's voice at the mic position. So in the really poor uh, room example that we were talking about before, uh, you might have a constraint where you've got to be this close to the microphone. We can step out to the good room, move the talker out to 10 feet, and we can see that now that the spoken word from the talker has gone from 56 dB at the microphone. We've doubled the distance, so we've lost 6 dB at the mic, and we're down to 50 dB at the microphone. Well, if our noise floor doesn't change, uh, if we were to keep the same noise floor shown in the previous picture of 44 
dB, we'd only be 6 dB above that noise floor. We really want a noise floor that's going to be uh, much lower for this room. So we're looking for a noise floor max at about uh, 38 dB. So again, it's gonna vary by how far your users are and what you consider to be an acceptable level of background noise in any reinforcement uh, or in any far end uh, application. Noise reduction will definitely help. It'll buy extra space uh, in this, but we wanna start with the mechanical space. We wanna start with the actual physical room and move from there. We mentioned before also that we have custom blocks, which are part of the library. Um, these are unique to the uh, TCM beam tracking microphones, and they have some processing elements within them that are necessary for good behavior with these mics. So these are available within the processing library, and you just uh, drag and drop them right into your file and then connect them to the pendants. Within these, we have a level control that's a fixed level control. Uh, we've got EQ for each of the pendants. We've got a beam tracking auto mixer, which is going to be doing the intelligent mixing for the microphones. Then we've got AGC following that beam tracking auto mixer. That's managing your user level uh, to provide a consistent output level to the far end. We've got a standard mixer to sum all of those, and then we go out to the output. And so the output there would be what you're sending to your far end. We've also got logic outputs, which we can be sending to the microphone uh, block itself to give LED feedback. And we'll take a look at what we can do with those in a few minutes. So now I have a look at the Tessera software itself. If we come in, we can choose the one or the one A from our mics uh, drop down menu. We'll take a one A, drop this in. We have some choices on the default uh, LED logic behavior. Uh, the LEDs always follow the device mute status or logic inputs control LED. This will give us a few extra nodes on the device. Uh, we can choose how many microphones are participating in this. So the first one is always the TCM one or one A. If you do two inputs, now it's a one or one A plus an EX, and if you had three inputs, now it's with two of the EXs. So we can drop that in, and it gives us the amplifier channels. So we've got our amplifier output, as well as having the TCM inputs. The default height will come up at six foot six inches. We want to get the microphone close to the user again. That'll give us better results in terms of the acoustics. And uh, this gives you your azimuth tracker. Uh, we can modify the input level if necessary. Uh, we've got a mute block here, which will mute because this is uh, being ganged. We can do it on all the mics. We can choose in the block preferences. If you prefer to not mute them as a group, they will mute independently. And if this is minimized, then we just get the azimuth trackers and we can see that for all three microphones. Again, this is three different pendants when we see this. That's not uh, not one microphone. Uh, it's three different microphones in the room. And as we're laying this out, typically this is going to be in an AEC application. So we would put some AEC inputs here along with it. can deassociate the AEC input block from that. And we'll wire through the AEC block. And then after the AEC block, we'll put in our custom block. So if we go to the processing library, we'll see here we have the TCM1 custom blocks. We choose the number of pendants that we have and drag that right into the file. We can modify this block to just be three channels if you want to. And now we've got the mix out and this will be sent to your matrix and onto the far end, whether that's over VoIP or Skype or whatever your uh, transmit media is. 
Here we've got the mic output uh, for the active mics and for AGC activity as well within the block. So if we open up the block, we can see these are wired up to the beam tracking auto mixer to track the open gate and then to the AGC to see if uh, gain control is being applied to them. We can use these output nodes to tie over to the uh, logic nodes here to drive the LED state behavior. And so we can indicate either mute state or mic active state or both. Uh, it all depends how you want to wire those up. And we'll have a look at those in a few minutes. Um, with the customized LED activity, you can see a little bit better here, it's a little bit bigger. Um, by default, if you choose the none, LEDs always follow mute status, then the mute input will drive the mute uh, LED. So if you drive a logic high into the mute, we'll get red LED status on the mics. If we choose logic input controlling the LEDs, now we can get, we'll get a couple of extra nodes. We get the mute input, we also get an LED uh, input, which will toggle the LED on and off. It's not following the mute input anymore. And then we've got an RG, which is red green, which will toggle the color between red and green. So we've got an off state, uh, a green or a red, and we can trigger that in real time. So you can flip flop the colors. Um, you know, the LED can be active and by turning the red green on and off, we can swap between red and green uh, while the mic is active. We get questions occasionally on using these in combinable spaces. Uh, we can do that. We have to modify the custom block slightly, um, just to adding an output node for the combiner block. Uh, so you would take the mix output and just connect that to your output, and that goes onto your auto mixer combiner. The standard mix out continues to go over to your matrix mixer. So this will allow you to do divisible spaces and combine them, uh, still leveraging the auto mixer combiner functions. And so it will be all the uh, beam tracking uh, auto mixers will behave as one in a combined state and will operate independently of one another uh, in a divisible room. Another question we get uh, about the TCM ones is mix minus capabilities. Uh, do we recommend them for mix minus? Uh, I'd say that one is a tricky one. Um, if we are doing PAGNAG calculations, we'll always see that a closed mic solution is going to be the most stable solution. So a handheld mic, a lavalier, a gooseneck mic on a podium, um, those have always been the preferred method of miking a talker for mix minus. Uh, ceiling mics have never been recommended for mix minus applications uh, unless you are doing extreme far back of house um, reinforcement uh, where you don't have any bleed over. Um, so we prefer that ceiling mics be used for transmission to far end locations uh, because we don't have any trouble with that at all. Um, when you start introducing local reinforcement, um, we've got a microphone which is covering 360 degrees. You've got to be very uh, cognizant of when you're doing your PAGNAG calculations that you're getting your uh, calculations correct. Uh, with sufficient separation between the mic and the loudspeaker, the mix minus can be done with ceiling mics, but your tonality and results will never compare with a closely held presenter mic. Um, so yes, it can be used for mix minus. We don't encourage it because uh, it's really not the application for any ceiling mic. Uh, we wouldn't recommend it for ours or for anyone's. Um, so nothing unique to the TCM-1 in this case, it's just uh, ceiling mics in general being on the roof uh, close to the speaker and far from the person doing the talking are generally always a bad solution for uh, mix minus. So we're gonna take a look at a few of the control options um, for discovery. Uh, we'll go back to the software and look at those within Tessera software. When we go out to device maintenance, We'll find we have our fortes as expected. If we go to remote devices, this is where we'll find the uh, pendants listed. So we have a TCM1A pendant here. Um, when we go down to the TCM1A properties, 
This brings up our box, which shows us the TCM1A. And then we've got one daisy chained, one uh, TCM1EX, and the second EX is not present. So we just have two microphones in this situation. Your network settings, it'll bring up your AVB settings, it'll show your peer delay and MAC address for the uh, device, and also MAC addresses for the controller interface. So if you need to track down your MAC addresses on a per device basis, this is where you do it. And device description is editable. Um, right now it's just named single pendant. We can modify that to be whatever we like. The locate feature uh, for the TCM1, when we hit locate, we'll start the location uh, illuminations flashing on the microphones. So we get our LEDs pulsing on the mics and this will go until canceled. So it allows you to easily find out which microphones have been wired up, which ones are active in the ceiling uh, and useful to you. I mentioned earlier uh, that you can do a simple Q bus system for your microphones. Uh, the way we've done that in the past here, let's drop in a Forte VI to use with this. And we'll forgot to add my USB blocks there. Through the use of a source selector, you can drop in a very straightforward, yeah, let's just clean this up. We'll just go with the USB output only uh, for the illustration. Uh, a straightforward way of doing this with a source selector. And we can take multiple channels. So we want to do four channels. We can now compare the premix output of each microphone plus the mixed out of the microphone. And we can route that to our USB output. You can listen through headphones on your computer, or you could take it to an analog output and connect headphones to the analog output and have a listen to uh, what's happening with that particular microphone. So it allows you to debug, especially if you have uh, noise sources in the room and you're not sure which microphone is being impinged uh, by air handlers or by uh, ambient noises. Uh, this allows you to quickly debug it. Uh, it's a very quick and easy to use uh, method. And then when you're finished with commissioning, you can just drop this out of your file. Um, it doesn't need to be there for daily operations. So as we build out our file, get our USB input block back here. For a simple conferencing system, we might do something where we have uh, Have the right controls there. The USB input coming in for program and for far end audio. Uh, local reinforcement being done at our loudspeakers. So we're just sharing for the same zone. Uh, whatever's going to the speakers would go to the reference. We'll send that over to there. Uh, USB output. And there's our transmit. So in a uh, very simple world, that is our complete uh, system right there. We've got uh, three microphones in the room. We've got two channels of amplification. We've got a USB output and input uh, for far end audio. And we've got a, a very simple system. You'll notice the AEC reference being tagged over here. Uh, we always wanna make sure whatever's going to the far end is being sent to that reference. Um, 
or whatever's arriving from the far end is being sent to the reference. Uh, when the uh, reference is getting signal, it will freeze the beam tracking motion. So we'll lock wherever our users were sitting uh, when they last spoke. When the far end starts talking, it'll freeze the beam at the user location so it won't track up to the loudspeaker. And when the far end stops talking again, then it will release again and track the participants in the room. So it's a pretty straightforward behavior. Uh, it allows us to avoid unnecessary uh, shifting of the mic lobes so we're not constantly tracking back to active users. Now within this uh, block here, we've got the active outputs. We can take those to uh, some logic mix down and do some comparisons. We can run this into a, an OR gate. So if any of these mics become active, we could light up all the LEDs active. Uh, we could take these individually to the elements to light them up and show that the mic is turning on. So if I were to pull mic one active and bring this over to LED number one. Now, whenever this light goes active or whenever this mic uh, is open in the gating auto mixer, the LED will turn active. Uh, by default, it's red, so we probably don't want that. So we can just pull another logic connection over to the RG toggle. And when that goes high, it turns the light green. So now whenever somebody talks on at mic number one, uh, at pendant number one, the LED will turn on and show green while they're talking. We can repeat that action for number two and number three, and then each microphone will turn up, uh, will turn green as somebody talks. It's a nice confidence monitor for somebody in the room, uh, so they're not left guessing uh, as to whether or not they're actually uh, triggering the microphones. When we combine multiple spaces, we've talked uh, briefly there about the com uh, auto mixer combiner. So we double up our number of rooms here, number of microphones. Uh, I mentioned that we would need to utilize the new uh, activity. So let's give ourselves a second zone with a unique AEC reference for zone two as well. We'll have two channels of USB input. We've got two zones of uh, output, two inputs, one for each room. Our mix out, which we can run to the uh, matrix mixer. Bump this down for oops, room number two. When we want to drive our gating auto mixer uh, combiner, we'll choose this. Oops. We'll grab the auto mixer combiner block. This won't connect to this node because this is not the output node of the gating auto mixer within the block. So we look in that block and we're not actually, we need to connect to this node here. So we need to bring that to the end of the block. Um, easy to do. You just go to your block parameters, add one audio output, open up the block, and we'll pull this wire right across. We'd repeat the activity for this one down below. And you could always just uh, Simplify this, just duplicate this block. Now we have the mix out feeding our auto mixer combiner, and we can leverage the power of the auto mixer combiner to take these two standalone rooms and join the two auto mixers within them so they function as one large auto mixer. So when we break that divisible wall between the rooms, the two uh, beam tracking blocks function as one and 
the six microphones work in conjunction with one another. So it's a very powerful uh, a tool to use with this system. Let's see here. I'm going to grab a video here to hopefully display. If it will cooperate and let me find the video. Let me pull up a downloaded copy of that. All right, so this is the uh, audio pendants. Bring this over. Here we can see a room with three pendants and a participant walking around the room. So we've got the user who's following around this first microphone. You see the azimuth trackers tracking them. The other two microphones sense somebody out there, but they're not, uh, uh, because it's the same signal from the same talker, uh, the first microphone would be active in this case. The second two would not be. As the participant goes to the second microphone and starts talking with somebody across from them, uh, we'll see the activity swap side to side. And then finally, the user walked to the back of the room and had a conversation left and right across the microphone at the rear of the room. So we'll see some tracking activity from the other two microphones. But again, the intelligent mixing is going to choose the strongest signal from the participant and is going to pick that one in the gating auto mixer uh, for the uh, output to the actual user. Let's see another. display here. This is the two blocks open and minimized. So we've got the left side of the room and the right side of the room. Um, we've got our output logic connected to a logic meter over here. And we've got the output AGC logic connected to the second half of the meter. So we can see as a participant walks around the room that the mics are transitioning from one to the next. We can watch their activity in the azimuth tracker. Um, as they're being sensed by the microphones, and we see the metering for the microphones as well. And so the same logic activity that we're seeing here can be driving the LED activity on the microphone, so we can have that green confidence LED uh, showing users where they are in the room and uh, give them the ability to have the confidence that their mic is turned on, or if all the mics are muted, that the mics are turned off. All right. Um, I think we are uh, a little ahead of schedule, kind of ran through the uh, material pretty quickly there. Um, so that covers the basics of the TCM microphone with a couple of little applications. We do have some tech notes on the TCL microphones within the support.viamp.com. Uh, when you come in and search for the TCM, my, we've got the mic calculator. Uh, we've got an article on tips and tricks, which is helpful for you because uh, a few of these things that we've talked about today uh, won't necessarily stick, but when you want to come in and have a look at what, uh, what you need to know about the mics, this is a great reference. Um, Give system device, device count limitations for you. Uh, talks about the custom blocks and how they are utilized. Talks about the auto mixer combiner and how to implement that. Talks about how to adjust gating hold time if you need to uh, customize the settings. Walks through the behaviors of the LEDs on the devices. And so this is a really great uh, little reference for uh, implementation. If you have questions, we're constantly updating these articles uh, so we can give, uh, you know, as we determine new applications, as we determine new uh, kind of cool little features we can implement with them, uh, we'll post them here and so we can see all kinds of interesting things. Um, we've got a little blurb here on camera tracking activity. 
where we can pull the microphone for where the azimuth tracker is is tracking to in the room and so you can get some uh, feedback from the microphone in terms of the angle of response uh, where the active uh, talker is uh, so that's kind of a little feature you might want to implement um, we talk about the option of pulling the microphone up closer to the ceiling versus uh, bringing it down close to the user. Again, we always recommend bringing it as close to the user as possible. You're going to have much better audio. Um, as you push it further away from the talker, uh, the, you get more of the room ambience, less of the direct uh, sound from the talker's voice. And so it's a little bit, uh, you know, it's a losing proposition as you get further away. We always like to put them as close as possible. Uh, further reading, we've got uh, information on the DSP blocks. Microphone help documentation is online. Uh, your data sheets and manuals are all here. We'll come back to the previous page. Um, we've got a small system room file uh, in our design library for the beam tracking microphone, just a, a starting point for you. Uh, an article on the beam tracking ceiling mics and how the various components work together. Uh, what we require for PoE, uh, all the basics. So any of the technical reference that you need is available online. Uh, that's always there for you. So again, we always recommend uh, starting with the calculator, plot your room out, uh, get a feeling for how many mics you're going to need in the space. Uh, discuss with the end user uh, kind of what the noise floor of the room is going to be if they need to put in some new air handlers or things like that to uh, bring it down, make it a better use case. Uh, we definitely recommend that. Uh, if you can do it before the installation date, that always helps. Um, we've got the tips and tricks article for walking through components. Uh, and within the tips and tricks, as I said, we'll constantly be updating this. Uh, as we learn new things, uh, as more and more of these are put into the field. Um, but really the nice thing about the TCM one is that we don't need a lot of tips and tricks. We drop it in, we connect the system as shown uh, here, and that's our full system. Uh, there's not a lot of time invested in uh, having to troubleshoot. Uh, these mics really just go. Uh, the biggest constraint is we wanna have a reasonably good sounding room to begin with. Um, I've been doing support with Biamp for a number of years now. Uh, we always joke that we never get a call from somebody with a good sounding room. Uh, we always get calls from rooms that don't sound good. And so we're trying to massage it to get the best possible result from a bad sounding room. Um, so if you can get the space sounding good and then put a mic into a good sounding space, it always helps you out uh, at the end of the day. So with that, I think uh, we are going to give you back a few minutes in your hour and say that uh, thank you very much for participating today. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. All right. Thank you.